Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, Dining with the Damned. On this playlist, we discuss criminals who are sentenced to die. We discuss their crimes and the events that led up to them being on death row. Then we talk about their last meal request and I show it to you and I taste it. I'm Stacy Lee, let's begin. Lowell Lee Andrews was born on September 21st, 1940 in Walcott, Kansas to William and Opal Andrews. He had a normal childhood, at least from what we know, and he was well-liked in his community. He was mild-mannered, sometimes even quiet. He was smarter than some of the kids his age, and he was accepted to Kansas University after he graduated from high school. He majored in zoology, and he played the bassoon in the Kansas University marching band. People had no way of knowing that this very average-looking and acting young man had violent fantasies of killing his parents, of poisoning people, and of moving to Chicago to join the Mafia and become a hitman. Lowell Andrews never spoke of his dark desires, and so it wasn't until he did something really horrific that there was any kind of a clue he was dangerous. Lowell left his dorm at Kansas University and went home for the Thanksgiving holiday in 1958. His sister, 20-year-old Jenny Marie, had also come home to be with the family for the holiday. Lowell sat in his childhood bedroom reading The Brothers Karamazov, which is the last novel written by Dostoevsky that's kind of a murder mystery and courtroom drama. It's actually a book about the dangers of judging others and why we should forgive one another's faults, but that message didn't seem to sink into Lowell Lee Andrews' brain. Lowell's sister and his parents sat in the living room watching television. Lowell finished reading his novel, he went into his bathroom and he shaved, he combed his hair, he put on his best suit, and then he retrieved his 22 caliber rifle and a revolver from the family gun rack. He walked into the family's living room where his parents and his sister sat spending time together, lifted his rifle, and shot his sister right between the eyes. Before his parents could even move, he shot them one at a time. He shot his father William, 50 years old, twice, and then shot his mother Opal, 42 years old, three times. His mother was able to stand and began to move towards Lowell. He shot her an additional three times as she came towards him. His father was not dead either. William fell from the couch to the floor and began to crawl to the kitchen. His son stood over him with a revolver and shot him repeatedly, in total 17 times. So this was a very violent crime committed against family members. It's really quite disturbing. Lowell then set about making the crime look like a burglary. He opened a window in the house to try to make it appear as though someone had broken in. Lowell then left the house and drove to the nearby town of Lawrence, Kansas. He went back to his apartment at 1305 Tennessee Avenue and made sure that other residents there saw him. He told them he needed to pick up his typewriter to write an essay. He walked around the building saying hi to people in order to try and establish an alibi. Lowell then went to the Granada movie theater where he watched the film Mardi Gras starring Pat Boone. When the movie was over, Andrews drove to the Kansas River, took apart the two guns he used in the murder, and threw them off the Massachusetts Street Bridge. He then went back to his parents' house where he pretended to find the family murdered. He called the police from the house and told them there had been a robbery and everyone in the house had been shot. So the police get to the scene of the crime and immediately can feel something is off. They find Lowell not sobbing, not sitting on the stairs of the house crying, not upset, but playing with the dog in the front yard. I'm sure that was, you know, a pretty obvious and immediate red flag. The house didn't look like the house at a typical burglary. Nothing was missing and not much was in disarray. The house did not appear to be ransacked as if someone had gone through cabinets and drawers looking for things to steal. And then there was, like I said, Lowell's behavior. He wasn't upset at all. The police were alarmed at how Lowell was calmly standing in the middle of a massacre with his family lying dead all around him and showed no emotion whatsoever. He wasn't upset, he wasn't shocked, he wasn't crying. He was just speaking to police normally as if nothing had happened. 
The police decided to call the family's minister, a pastor named Verdio C. Dameron of Grandview Baptist Church in Kansas City, and they asked him to sit down and speak with Lowell. As the pastor sat and spoke with Lowell, who he had known since childhood, he finally confessed to what he had done. He told his pastor, I'm not sorry and I'm not glad I did it. I just don't know why I did it. I didn't even feel anything as they died. He then told the pastor he did it because he wanted to inherit the family farm and obtain $1,800 that his father had in savings. The residents of the area were shocked and horrified by the crime. Neighbors and friends were interviewed by the media. One of them told a newspaper reporter why he was the nicest boy in Walcott. Teachers, relatives, and clergy were all speechless and could not come up with any reason at all as to why this mild-mannered young man committed this horrible crime. The sheriff at the time, a man named Gordon Dale Chapel Sr. said, Lowell was always very polite. This sheriff's son knew Lowell from the time the boys were 13, and he couldn't wrap his mind around what he had done. The sheriff said, I do know one thing, Lowell has no remorse, I can tell you that. I was very curious as to whether or not they ever had a psychiatrist interview Lowell, and I found some accounts that said they did, but I wasn't very successful in finding out if there was a diagnosis or what that psychiatrist thought about Lowell. It would sure have been interesting to have him interviewed later on in his life to see what kind of psychopathy made up a person that could do this. The police began to search the river for the weapon parts. Officer Chapel watched the search for the weapons at the dumping side of the river. The police actually took Lowell with them to the search so he could point to where he dropped the gun parts. Chapel said, I can remember they were dragging down there with big magnets and they had divers. The searchers were successful in finding some parts of the guns, but not all of them. The found parts helped to solidify the case against Lowell. Lowell Lee Andrews was put on trial and pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The jury didn't buy his argument and he was sentenced to death for the murders. He appealed his conviction all the way through the Supreme Court, but the highest court let his conviction stand. One of the officers often assigned to accompany Lowell to and from court said, he was always quiet and polite, never gave us any trouble. Lowell was on death row during the same time as Richard Hickok and Perry Smith were. These two men are the perpetrators of the Clutter family murders, which of course are the subject of Truman Capote's famous 1965 novel, In Cold Blood. Lowell is mentioned in that book several times and is then portrayed by C. Ernst Harth in the film entitled Capote. He's also portrayed by Ray Gastot in the film Infamous, and then again portrayed by Bowman Upchurch in the film version of the book In Cold Blood. A lot of people believe that the Lowell Lee Andrews murders would have become much more well known had they not taken place in the same era as the Clutter family murders. His crime was so horrific, but a lot of people aren't even aware of it because the media focused mainly on the murders at the center of the Capote book. Richard Hickok, one of the killers on death row with Lowell, said of him, I really liked Andy. He was a nut. Not a real nut, like they keep hollering, but you know, just goofy. He was always talking about breaking out of here and making his living as a hired gun. He liked to imagine himself roaming around Chicago or Los Angeles with a machine gun in a violin case, cooling guys. Said he'd charge a thousand bucks per stiff. So, you know, you can kind of picture this. He seems to be a guy who really lived in a fantasy world. He was just kind of this quiet, normal, average kid, but he fancied himself some kind of a hitman. I even read a couple of accounts that said he thought one day he was going to be the head of the mafia. He was considered a nerdy kid and, like his death row friend said, goofy. Lowell's appeals ran out and the time came to carry out his sentence. On November 30th, 1962, Lowell Lee Andrews was given his last meal request, which of course I'm going to show you. He was taken to the gallows and prepared for execution. When he was asked if he had any last words, he nodded no and said nothing. The rope was placed around his neck and he was hanged at age 22. What did Lowell Lee Andrews request for his last meal? I'm going to show you.
This is Lowell Lee Andrews' last meal. He had two whole fried chickens, green beans, mashed potatoes, and pie a la mode. Let's give it a taste. <laughs> it's great fried chicken. Fried chicken's one of the best things in the world. I definitely wouldn't be able to eat two whole fried chickens, but I do like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's taste these green beans. Yeah, they're great. Even canned green beans are good. He had mashed potatoes. If you watch this channel, you know how much I love potatoes. Mm. Those are really good. <laughs> Who doesn't love mashed potatoes, right? And then he had pie a la mode. Got a little piece of apple pie here, some vanilla ice cream. Mm. That's a pretty good pie crust. A little bite of ice cream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love vanilla ice cream. So it's a pretty basic meal, kind of a lot of chicken. But other than that, you know, pretty standard American fare. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Dining with the Damned. I sure hope you're well, and I want you to know that I appreciate you spending a few minutes of your day with me. If you haven't subscribed to the channel and you like the content, please do that. It helps me a lot. Stay safe and be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.